Excellent. Okay. I'm going to formally kick us off by saying welcome everyone for what is our second webinar for this week, but the third in our series of lessons around community organising and digital campaigning, where we have looked at things that have been happening in elections domestically and around the world to see what best examples we can bring to you to add a bit of oomph to your day. I'm a big believer in when times are tough, as they have been this year, that we need to look up and out and get a shot of inspiration and hope. And so this is your daily dose or twice weekly dose of hope brought to us today from Larissa Baldwin. I do want to start by uh, acknowledging country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm joining you from Gadigal land and we have people here from all over the place. So if you wanted to, I know some of you already put this in your name on Zoom, but you might also want to drop into the chat to say hi, introduce yourself and say where you are joining from. And in acknowledging country, reminding ourselves that sovereignty was never ceded, that we are living and working on stolen land and have in one way or the other been the beneficiary of those atrocities and pledge ourselves to uh, doing everything we can to support First Nations justice. Just particularly apt today, because we are going to hear about a community organizing effort that was on the ground in the Northern Territory around voter engagement for the Northern Territory election uh, with a particular focus on Aboriginal people in remote communities in the Northern Territory. I'm really delighted that we have Larissa Baldwin with us today. Hi, Riss who's the First Nations campaign lead for Get Up. And for those of you who followed the adventures at the time, Rhys and a group of other people who were part of the organising effort drove, I feel I look this up all the time because I get my zeros wrong, but 40,000 kilometres around the Northern Territory to talk to different community members about what mattered to them and think about what it meant to them that this election was coming up. So the way we're going to do this is um, Riss is going to share her insight, share what happened, insights around that effort, and we'll have a time, uh, have plenty of time to take questions. And we'll probably also give you time in breakouts to just compare notes on what it means for you and your work. There's a couple of things I want to say about these webinars. Um, we are focusing on case studies because I think hearing specific examples is really useful for us to then think about what that means for our work. But at the same time, we recognize that because something works for one community or one place or one context doesn't mean you just take it as a cookie cutter. So I do wanna give us time to process what are both the specific insights from this example, but what are the generalizable things that are reinforced around the way we think about organizing and campaigning. So we can have a bit of that conversation in breakouts. So the process will be, we'll hear from Larissa, um, I might try to draw a few things out or ask a few top line questions. We'll do breakouts where you can start thinking about that for yourself and then we'll come back and that will um, give you a chance to ask questions of the Risa before we finish. So Riss, over to you. Over to me. Am I mute? No. Uh, Jinky well, everyone. My name is Larissa and yeah, the First Nations Justice Campaigns Director at Get Up. Um, so we're going to talk about the NT election and our approach to it um, and kind of what we achieved. But I first wanna start off with a little bit of context. So I've been working in the Northern Territory uh, targetedly on a fracking campaign uh, for on about five years uh, with about 14 different communities over the territory. Um, and for context for the NT election, the last NT election that we ran in 2016, we were very much about trying to get a ban up on fracking. Um, that was the focus of our campaigning work with communities uh, and trying to get a moratorium locked in and that sort of stuff. Our approach to this election, uh, so in 2016, uh, Labor basically won by a landslide. There was no opposition to them really within the NT government. And, uh, you know, they broke a lot of promises to the community, but they kind of were elected on this idea that, you know, they were going to be this big change. Uh, and the previous election before that, a lot of the Aboriginal communities and bush seats that we we're talking about in the Northern Territory had like voted the country Liberal Party in, which is the Liberal National Party in the NT. So it seemed these bush seats kind of go back and forwards, Labor get elected and not do the things and remove the moratoriums and, you know, kind of push against that advocating for fracking. So where we were at with the communities that we're working at is there's an election coming up. It's really important, but 
our communities that we're working with were really, really disillusioned with the government and just seeing that there was no positive change that people could make in terms of a government um, and, you know, why do we even vote? They don't listen to us, they don't do the things that we wanted them to do. And on a broader scale, uh, you know, the work within the First Nations team, we really look at this thing around electoral power around our communities, not having a lot of electoral power. We are seeing more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in parliaments, but that's a really recent thing. But in terms of um, politicians being feeling like they are responsible or accountable to an, a constituency that is black in this country, we don't feel like that's something that's happening. So on the numbers, when we look at the federal seats, we know that there are seven seats where the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are enrolled to vote are higher than the margin of people needed to switch the seat. And so our electoral strategy in a long-term way in the First Nations team is to really see if we can build electoral power through accountability and First Nations participation in elections. Um, so that means when we go out with a campaign, um, it would be harder for us to kind of uh, take a campaign out into the NT or into any of these communities or seats um, and just like kind of run a test and be like, well, this might be the campaign that works. So our approach to the NT election was really to go out to these communities and be like, look, we work on fracking together. We know that's really important, but there's an election coming up. Do you want to work on an election campaign with us? And so in, since 2019, we've been meeting uh, with community members around what are the types of things that people would like to see movement on issues. So a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, into 2019, uh, early 2020, after the wet season was to have meetings with people and talk about, uh, you know, what were the types of issues, where the government was at, that was really good to build a lens of like, you know, this government hasn't done everything, but where are the pieces where they have done things, where are opportunities to build pressure on them? Why would they listen to us? All these types of things. So a lot of organizing around how elections build power other than, you know, just using your one vote, because the other thing culturally within our communities is that Aboriginal people in communities don't trust decisions made by individuals. So the idea that an individual vote can change the course of something is not something that resonates with people. So we really want to go out and have a conversation about how do we collectivize votes? So how do we have the conversations before we get to the voting booth and where are the, and like, uh, and viewing the election day as just one day on a journey around holding politicians accountable. And so in that way, we've kind of framed the election. We know we're not trying to change government. We don't want a CLP government in the NT. We know that's not going to work and it's not going to take us forward on any of the issues. But at the same time, we have a Labor government that's, uh, you know, in our uh, view, has become kind of, uh, you know, they're not accountable to the communities that they're working in. And the communities uh, don't see these politicians within their communities, uh, even though they voted them in four years ago. So they kind of voted them in and then we see, and then they don't see anything of them. So a lot of the work in the lead up to the election was, yeah, talking about the issues um, getting to see if people wanted to take action and kind of uh, be part of turning people out on the vote or in the early days kind of giving them the conversation to have across the community. So we're going around uh, having community meetings that were really small, like we had have women's groups, young people, uh, we just call a meeting, we just talk about community issues and where the government was at and what people wanted to see. We also talked about the candidates and who was running in the election. We talked about how the electoral system worked and we talked about who represented, who, how people thought they could be represented. And so one thing that came out really big within the community is that they really felt like Aboriginal people needed to be elected into government, but also they need to be not tied to that major party. So this idea around Aboriginal independence being able to represent us, and there was a really good example of Alvinia, who is a member for Mulka, which is in Arnhem Land, and the way that he campaigns and represents people differently and the fact that he meets with a lot of people, even though they're not in his seat, people are like, that's the model of representation that we want. So people were excited that Aboriginal independents had put themselves on the ballot. And so from that, people got excited about, well, let's get engaged and see if we can get our communities and get these people that are running on independence um, to talk about the issues we care about. So with the in the 2016 election, we went out with scorecards into communities just to show them more about the vote. And, um, and the policies. And so that was our kind of theory of change. We show people maybe they'll vote on issues. One of the things we realized in the uh, last federal election, we were asked by communities out in Nooka and remote communities was that people really wanted us to tell them how to vote on the issues, which is something that we, even though we're at Get Up, we didn't assume that was something that communities wanted. So um, people were just like, how do we vote on these issues? It was really funny, like people going up to Warren Snowden, like, how do we vote for the green one? <laughs> it was just like, it was like, so frustrated, but it was really good. And also like we had given, um, you know, at the, 
you know, part of the community members and volunteers we were working with at the last federal election, you know, we'd had kind of like a thumb system, so orange key if people hadn't agreed on stuff. And there was a, uh, Labor got a thumbs down on the intervention. And, uh, you know, Warren Snowden being out there and then, you know, community members being like, well, you said you were going to get rid of this thing and it's still here. And he said, yes, it is still here. And they're like, well, what are you going to do about it? And so even though when it's election day, that changes the dynamic around people feeling like they can bail up politicians, which has always been our strategy in the NT around building power and, you know, uh, and saying and asking for what you need when you meet the people who are in charge and who have the uh, ability to deliver the things that you need within communities. So that was uh, from the initial meetings, we developed a scorecard um, with people. Uh, we translated into to simplified English and then into Creole. Uh, and then we went out with community members uh, as there were a lot of lead community members who we employed during the election to go out and get out the vote and have conversations with people in language. Um, and also enrol people to vote. So the other thing that's happened is like through the automatic update process that's happened federally. So if you change your name on Centrelink or your tax, um, basically it'll automatically change your name on the roll. It has the opposite effect in remote communities where it's removing people from the roll because their names don't, like they might have their address at a, um, the post office or they might change their name through Centrelink and that automatically removes them. So also we're seeing this thing where people across remote communities are being taken off the roll. So we did run a big election strategy and a big enrollment drive um, that was about getting people uh, on the rolls. And we were successful in enrolling it through the digital campaign. Seed also ran a really wonderful like TikTok campaign, uh, getting young people to talk about where they are in communities. Knowing that within First Nations communities across Australia, we have a higher uptake on Facebook and TikTok platforms than the general population, which is good to know. So we really focused on getting people to motivate. Uh, so Seed run a competition where they put a, like a, I think a thousand dollar prize or something like that. And uh, we uh, basically ran stories about people telling why they were voting in the election uh, into communities and targeted that, geo-targeted that into communities. Um, so I want to show you a video. From, are you able to share? Yep, sounds good. One second. Sharing. Uh, let me know if you can't hear any sound. To the government, make something happen. If you're a truthful person in your heart, if you're not, why are you sitting on that seat? Everybody out there, you want to listen how I live? I don't live like people that got a house you live in nice and peaceful house and really quiet with just your family i don't live in a house i live in a tent out in the bush <laughs> my kids just growing up in a tent they're not like ordinary kids running here. they carry their puffers they carry their medications and I'm out living there with dust blowing, fire, smoke. COVID-19 came out. You know what I did? I sat and cried with my kids because I don't have anywhere to keep them protected. How do you feel about the fact that they're building houses for, you know, public housing in big cities and regional areas, but not in the community? What do you think about that? I would like to know that answer. Why is the government sitting in big money and don't build a house out here? What are they doing with that money? I grew up with a wonderful family, a really beautiful, loving family. But it's just they didn't have any spare rooms to put me in. I want my kids to grow up different than me. My dad died waiting for a house. Government is too slow. We don't need to go in the city. I'm been destroyed. Everything been destroyed, history been destroyed. Here, this song line, history stuff, everything in this place. We need to be here.
I will speak up, I will stand and speak up because you know what? This community showed me knowledge and stuff. This community raised me up to be a woman that I am now. I was raised with respect, with culture, with language, with courage, honor, trust. I will do anything to keep my kids safe. I'm not just a mother that can let go. So that's Michaela. Um, Michaela was one of the women that came to kind of the organizing meetings. Um, she wasn't a volunteer on the election, but uh, one of the communities in Maniri had uh, convened a bunch of women to talk about the issues that they were focusing on. And then Michaela told her story. And then we asked her uh, basically if she wanted to, if she would tell her story. So part of one of our other objectives is that we know that in the NT government or the NT uh, and the federal government, because it's a territory, basically the responsibility around the social safety net, public housing, health services kind of lies between the two of them. And one of the issues that we deal with is that they basically kick it back and forth, like, no, it's you and not you. And they both, they either, the government doesn't give the money or the NT government doesn't spend the money. So over the last three years has been, uh, the NT government promised that they would spend a uh, hundred million dollars a year on Aboriginal housing. They've been getting the money in from the federal government and there has been big exposés that that money hasn't been spent. And so for about 10 years, we've had successive governments at state and ter at territory and federal level promise housing. And you now have this, this housing crisis that hasn't gone anywhere, where on average, there are four people living to a home. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do was create a national narrative. So we knew that the election result, it didn't matter who got um, elected, uh, that it necess wouldn't necessarily build more power on our campaign or build more power for the community organising work that we were doing around getting people politically active. So what we wanted to do is be able to demonstrate in other ways that there were success metrics for people. And so that was really about having a national narrative and making sure remote voices and their stories and their issues were in the national narrative, which was really good because we actually had a bunch of like ABC, Guardian, uh, there are a lot of different papers um, who were willing to cover a story that was about people and issues versus an election campaign as a horse race. And that was something that we constantly got back from the media. So they were really happy to, you know, for us to give the phone over to people from the remote, from remote communities. We had one situation where I was doing a Guardian interview and uh, I put one of the aunties on the phone and she was like, yeah, well, we, you know, they come out here every four years and try and get elected. And, you know, we're getting them elected and they're looking pretty good upstairs and we're looking pretty ugly down here still. And I was just laughing at her and she's like, should I have not have said that? And I was like, that's perfect. They're just, they're definitely going to quote that. And it was like the first line in there. So like this really human issues, human face to the issues that people are focusing on, not and not focused so much on the politicians because we know that communities that we're working with don't feel power in that situation. And so we did, one of the best things about that video with Michaela is that if you look in the comments and we've hidden some now because there was, uh, you know, some trolls that were getting on it, but there were lots of people from remote communities that were sharing that video and also saying that I'm living, I'm homeless too. We're living in a tent. There's five families in our house. Where is this housing? And so um, in terms of that video, how far outside the get up, it's like 60% of the reach and views on that video is outside of our get up base which is incredible in terms of where we were trying to reach and the types of people who that story resonated with. Um, there isn't a call to action on that video because it was about a story and the work that we were doing was really on the ground with people. So we wanted to tell a national story and create a platform. What we're seeing from the NT election, so just kind of a little bit on results and then if you have any questions, but in the communities that we worked in, so of the people that were enrolled to vote in the NT election, less than half the people turn out to vote. That's where the level of dissolution is in communities. There's like a quarter of people that could, uh, like, yeah, half, less than half the people that are enrolled and that like a quarter of the people. So it's like something like three electorates are missing uh, from the, elect the equivalent of three electorates are missing from the uh, roles in the NT when you're talking about representation, the redistribution of seats. So now seats because people have been taken off the rolls in South Alice Springs, you've seen the seat of Namajira turn into a, a seat that's predominantly white, even though there are huge remote communities that come under that. So the idea around representation, who's on the role, how those things are distributed, 
And this is something that we talked about with communities around why we should get people enrolled to vote because representation matters. And if people don't know you're here, then how does the Commonwealth fund services adequately in your communities? Um, and like, if we're not enrolled, then that's just less votes that people need to get elected. Um, so we really talked about these issues throughout the election in terms of getting people to the polls and people talking about, you know, we need you to go to the polls because here's all the issues that we care about. And we're talking about in the lead up to the election. You know, we, we hit so many different polling booths, but the, at the end of it, the results were like, in the seats that we worked, we either turned out almost all of the people that were enrolled to vote, or uh, we completely bucked the trend of there was a huge, like it was where it was going down in other places, it was going up in the communities that we're at. And that was about having people who were from lo local communities, speaking language, doing translation, making sure like they knew who hadn't turned out to the polls that so we'd just go get them and see like, it's voting day, come on, we'll, we'll take you down to the polls and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, in the seats of like Barclay where the Beedaloo, where there's going to be fracked, even though the CLP was elected in that seat, one of the things that the community, when we talked about in the, in the kind of wrap after the election where, you know, whether it was success or not, they said, you know what happened? Even though we lost, our communities voted with us and voted against fracking. So even though, you know, this person from the CLP got elected, they knew that their communities were with them. And overwhelmingly, uh, we had an Aboriginal independent re-elected who was, you know, won by eight votes last time, won by over 400 votes this time in the seat of Arnhem, the person who is currently the Aboriginal uh, uh, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Selena Ubio, we, she won that by over a thousand votes last time. She held on to it by 45 votes this time. And in the seat of Barclay where Beedaloo and where fracking will happen, um, basically uh, they won that seat by five votes and all basically the remote communities voted for the independent. So we showed that, we demonstrated that our communities will vote on issues but also that um, Aboriginal communities can't be taken for granted. So in the wrap up from the election, uh, basically these communities have been littered with ministers, uh, which were, they've been talking about housing. So this idea around accountability and getting people back out, um, you know, they've had people back out in Boralula, even though they're trying to push forward fracking. So, you know, the government's coming up and they said, let's talk about housing. Like, no, let's talk about fracking and housing and what are you doing? And, so this is, I guess, where we're trying to get through with the work that we're doing. It's not about a specific election campaign, but it's about building power and that's a more slower long-term goal. But where we're at, the community's excited. We're trying to go into a lot, uh, I guess, a wet season and a lockdown situation now, but community's like, what are we gonna do over wet season? We're gonna do over shutdown. I'm like, um, nothing, let's do it next year. But people are really excited to keep going. And I feel like that's the best place for us to be in post-election campaign where people are feeling really disillusioned with governments. Amazing. Thank you so much, Larissa. Heaps of stuff there. I want to highlight a few things and then we're going to uh, put people into breakouts of three. And so just to foreshadow for you in the breakouts, what I'd love you to have a chance to talk about with each other is what are the insights and ideas from Larissa's example for your own organising? And what more would you like to hear from Larissa? Like what more would you like? But before we do that, um, I've got a couple of things, a couple of questions or observations, Larissa. I loved a couple of things I want to lift. One is that you talked about how this work was building on the work you've been doing with communities around stopping the fracking and, and that this is part of, the election is part of a, a much longer journey of organising. So I think that's a really good insight to bring out. And the other was the way in which you framed it as being, even though this was using an election moment, it was a moment to build power, show relevance, get voices out there, and that it wasn't so much about who won. And I think that's something that troubles me a lot when organisations talk about organising in an election is that often they don't have the sort of metrics that you talked about, which is like, did we get more voices out there? Did we shift the narrative? Did we get people realising that there are more ways to strengthen democracy than the vote? Do we collectivise the vote? I think there's some really interesting insights there. So I really appreciate that. I don't know whether you want to comment on either of those. Yeah, I feel like if you, it was about considering the journey of taking people, like we had done a federal election campaign at GetUp and to be honest, within the broader scope of GetUp and our network, people were not happy with the result and people were really disillusioned at the end of it. And so we lost a lot of really good people through that process. And so for us, we didn't, we worked on a separate First Nations strategy at the federal election. But it was really fun of mine, like, what is the journey that we are taking people on? We don't want to hang people out to drive and over, over promise things that we can't deliver because this is about governments. We know governments, you know, have a whole bunch of vested interests as well. Also, there was a pandemic happening. So it's like, side note, there was a pandemic. 
and the biosecurity locks, uh, lockdown. So we didn't want to burn people. We wanted to make sure at the end of the, the action that we're taking, we could make people feel hopeful regardless of what their outcome was. Yeah. And for me, that lesson was so stark after May last year or whatever year it was, where everybody had taken a certain outcome for granted and really had pinned all their hopes on that and the disappointment for activists and volunteers when it didn't pan out that way. And I think that's because the single metric of success so often is about whether we changed the government or got certain candidates in. So I loved your metrics. So thank you for that. Okay, let's break you into threes. Reminder that um, what would be great would be to share amongst yourselves what insights and ideas you're taking from this for your own organising and maybe start foreshadowing what questions you might want to come back to ask Larissa in the big group. So we're going to take six minutes for that. So Fong's going to set up the breakout rooms now and then we'll come back and do a Q&A with Riz. everyone hope you had a chance to meet some new people or uh, reconnect with people you already know and were able to draw out some ideas and insights for your own organizing and as part of that conversation maybe came up with some things that you're keen to know more about so this is our opportunity to open to a Q&A slash discussion with RIS so um, we do have over 30 people here so maybe rather than just unmuting if you want to put up your zoom hand or type in the chat your question and um, we can take it from there where we won't have people sort of talking over each other but don't be shy or raise your real hand if you can't find your zoom hand and I'll keep an eye out for you <laughs> who has a question for Rhys or a comment around what you think you can take away as an insight Okay, I'm going to kick off then because as moderator. Oh, no, there you go, Dominic. I'll wait to ask mine. Dominic, go for it. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the Electoral Commission and how, how much do they, how much effort do they put into enrolling Indigenous communities? Um, and like, the, I know the AEC do a bit of work out um, in communities as well. Uh, were they collaborators on your kind of enrolment campaigns or? or um, did they make things harder? They got very mad at us. Um, so basically Morrison cut the Indigenous uh, program a few years ago. Oh, cut it back to basically nothing. So there's now one office. There used to be over 14 people in, uh, employed in the NT and now the NT rep, NT rep for the AEC and the Indigenous Enrolment Program is based in SA. And so they did not have the resources to go out into the communities, which means um, around when we were going into the election, there was a lot of commentary made from community members and we helped them get into the media, the fact that they were in biosecurity lockdown and they basically said, if you go before they announce the election, if you go to an election, you haven't been out there to enrol people, our can independent candidates haven't been able to get on the, um, and say that they're running or run campaigns and we can't travel into our remote communities because of the bio lockdowns like this is really going to hurt us and our ability to campaign in this election um which meant in the NT election what one thing we were successful at getting up which existed in kind of the policy but in terms of it acting was enacted because of that outrage was that um people could do provisional votes and so it meant that people could go up uh with an either identification or someone who could vouch for their identity on election day and say, I want to vote, and they could enrol to vote and cast the vote on the day. And that's the first time they, they'd done that in the MT election. Um, but one of the problems was, is that within the NT Electoral Commission, the polling officials weren't told or aware of that. And so we were seeing within the first week of the election, because remote polling happens for two weeks into the election, that, um, uh, basically they were being turned away from the polls and that sort of stuff. So we went kind of toe to toe with the electoral commission, which is not a really good place for us because they don't really like us at the moment since the last election. But um, yeah, and a lot of the stories that we were bringing out into the national narrative were about the fact that this funding was cut and that people didn't know the election was going to be out there. So we really politicized the issue around uh, people being taken off the rolls, the fact that the AEC funding had been cut and like the NT Electoral Commission kind of backed us in on a bunch of things and the AEC went at the NT is all very funny, but 
um, we definitely made it part of a huge part of the conversation um, and it was part of the kind of evaluation when Anthony Green was doing the counting the votes and that sort of stuff and it was a big part of the conversation on the desks with the politicians as well. Great, thank you. Interested in hearing from anyone whether um, you talked about some insights for your own organising that you'd like to uh, share and maybe get a comment from Larissa around how that might play out. And just while you have a think about that or a question, I have a question for you, Larissa. I'm really interested in how you identified the issues. So you talked about talking to community and identifying issues that mattered to people. And you also talked about a report card. Was the report, the content of the report card reflected what came from those conversations or did you go in your, yep. Yeah. Do you want to say a little bit more about yeah. that process? So we had kind of um, meetings. We had lots of kind of online and in-person meetings, which were small meetings with community members who would come and talk about issues they were facing. And then we would talk about what the solutions were to those things. And so the conversation was like, what are the type of solutions that we want to, um, that we want to ask the government? So we're going to go survey the government and ask them if they're willing to say yes to these things. So that was the point of the survey. We did a survey with the community's issues. Um, and solutions and through having lots of meetings we kind of collectivized the solutions that had um, I guess a lot of support around like taking the more um, liaison officers instead of police in communities taking guns off police um, hiring there was more ranges but also like uh, uh, having subsidies on on food was one of the big ones as well and so like uh, and then we had one around you know needing to build health services because people have to travel to either Adelaide or Darwin when they need acute care and so people like we want closer health services and stuff like that so that's how we did it and, and then we weighted those things and turned it into a scorecard so it's kind of like a protect country theme there was a health and housing um, one that was over policing uh, so there was kind of like seven issues and under those there were about 29 policy areas that we mm. developed in the communities or 29 policy solutions. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Great question in the chat from Aurora. How do you want to ask it? Do you want to unmute yourself? Introduce yourself? Hi, Larissa. I'm Maroha. Um, I was just really interested in um, whether you thought the community attitudes had changed with regards to them having... Um, power to make a difference. Uh, yeah. I know you said that they're excited afterwards, but do, do, do you feel that they their attitudes towards that change? Yeah, one hundred percent. It really the kind of mood when we did the debriefs in communities. We did three major debriefs. Um, was that people felt like they kind of disrupted the politicians' party, and that they had to, you know, they were part of the story, and you know, because they had been part of the election. In a bunch of the communities for the first time they actually watched some of the results and so when they were on the um watching the kind of federal ministers and people saying housing and fracking and talking about the community vote and that sort of stuff and the fact that community members were out because we had backgrounded the abc as well that was one of the things we were able to do through a relationship we built through the election campaign um and so people were hearing their campaign uh i guess being talked back to them and then yeah had this idea that they really had disrupted and I, I guess the energy was is just like we got to keep going so it was the campaign was more about the communities we were working with not the not the politicians and so from there people were just like so we worked in six different electorates which are you know this is 40 this is why we drove 40,000 kilometers like zigzag and we had multiple different teams and seed was also part of this they were helping on, on certain things and seed were out there cooking barbecues and uh, bringing people to the um to the polls and stuff like that um, so I definitely want to give them a shout out because they did a lot of work as well. Um, but yeah, people feel like, well, we didn't get to talk to the other communities and they're out there. And so they were really like really excited that there, this was energy was happening in other communities as well, even though they weren't interacting. They didn't know those people. But at the end of it, people were like, so when can we get together next year? So after COVID lockdown, we need to all come together and let's talk about what's next. And, you know, what's next isn't just about breaking what's next is you know, what do people want to do together? What are we going for? So it's like this idea around building community power and bringing more people in and they need to know what other people are saying. There's a lot of energy for that. And, you know, that's the kind of organising energy that kind of does the work for organisers. You know, when you get, that's like the sweet spot of like, from here, you have no control, but you know that you're going to have a lot of impact and a lot of energy. That's so true. Thank you for really bringing that out. Great question from Danny here about uh, Enroll to Vote work and how a lot of organisations don't do it either because we assume that everybody 
is enrolled because it's compulsory to vote or because those who aren't on the roll are so marginalised they'll be too hard to reach. Interested in your uh, insights in retrospect, I guess, around what are the challenges of doing enrolled to vote campaigning and in particular what you would do differently yeah. in future or advise other people? I mean, I really want to double down on our enrolment work. I feel like we, we kind of did a we did a proof of concept on enrolment work and it really had paid huge dividends. Over 6,000 people were added to the roles. And I also think in the progressive, like we can't take this for granted because we've seen in the US election that if we don't mobilize marginalized communities, our opposition will. We do need those votes. Um, and we, we need to work harder for those votes and work harder for those communities because we have also within, and I'm talking about, you know, generalizing here, but within the organizations that we've worked in really not included these people in our campaigns, in our policy asks. And so that's going to take more work in terms of the way that we build relationships, but also um, really co-collaborating campaign strategies and election strategies with them. So, you know, for us to say, you know, we can't say you need to vote because you need to be on the roll for all these reasons. We had to go out and have conversations and be like, get people to tell us why they wanted to vote or why they thought their community should vote and then help them have those conversations with the community. And that's what it took to enrol so many people. But I think our work is so important and I think there's not enough focus done on it. I think that's, what, you know, the youth vote in the US election has been really powerful. In New Zealand, it's been really powerful. Like it matters. We need to get people on the rolls and make sure people are turning out to vote. It's interesting thinking about the marriage equality survey, the big push to get people enrolled there so that they could have their say on that survey and it was again I think the thing around there was a reason to do it that people cared about rather than just you should enroll because you should enroll so it's great thank you any other questions or comments I hey I have a question Janani. yeah I was just wondering about like um, in our group we really reflected on sort of that deep relational organizing that you clearly did and those relationships that were built up um, and I guess I'm curious like obviously I can hear that there's um, excitement to do more um, and and just from like a get up organizational perspective like um, and, and you you seem to hit the sweet spot right and I'm kind of curious as to how you got there obviously it's like over years of trust and any sort of like um, like nuggets of wisdom around um, yeah like how long that takes because I think um, you know, I've reflected as as a union, like sometimes we just go in and get parachuted into campaigns and it's clearly not working. So I'd love to hear about like how you firstly like maintain this relationship um, and continue it and also like who within GetUp and the community, um, how that space it basically works. Yeah, I feel like for us, um, we never went out into communities in the end team of like, do you want to ban fracking? We went out, uh, to talk about climate change and that was the foundation that we built around you know how how people were being hurt by climate change but also what the solutions were to it throughout that process people understood that we can't be unlocking new gas basins and we collaborated on that campaign and built that campaign together but for for really you know i get asked questions around how we built across the nt we really trust the expertise of communities to map uh, and giving them the tools around how to map your community you know once we had done so much work solidly in Boral around surveying the community was like what's next and you know when we because we talked about you know the importance of water and the importance of connection to country and song lines and this sort of stuff people wanted to organize along those lines and people had family in other communities and so we followed their lead and, and kind of resourced that it was very I guess the work that we did across the NT was really iterative but I think within one of the smart decisions we made early on that was strategic was just to cut to a constituency like this is who we're focusing on and whichever way that goes um versus focusing on electoral power and, and and what that means because i think those those even electoral boundaries are really arbitrary when you're talking about moving and mobilizing disenfranchised communities and marginalized communities so we started with a constituency and we built from there and um you know, it takes a lot to resource, but also at the end of it. So when I moved, I was in Seed and I a uh, co-founder of Seed and I moved to Get Up. I was in this phase of like, well, I've moved off that campaign and I'm in a new organisation. But at the end of the day, uh, and I wasn't on the campaign for about five months uh, in a way that was like kind of branded and the organisation doing work, like I was still talking to people and that sort of thing. But 
you know, it was people reaching out to me and being like, this thing's happened, what are we doing? And I like went back to my organization. I was like, I have relationships here that I have invested into for years and I can't just abandon these relationships. And so there was a conversation around, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing there is organizing and that's what I do. And I help them organize in their communities and help resource that. And yeah, work was uh, pretty much like, yes, you can do that. Like, that's fine. It makes a lot of sense. We understand. And so we just started doing and supporting that work, but organizing, I guess where I'm getting to is like for organizing marginalized disenfranchised communities, for people who don't have a lot of power, you need to make a commitment and stick to your commitment. And it's a long-term commitment. And like, you need to also, there's little wins along the way that are really important to kind of note and understand that these are steps on the way to building to something bigger. And so you need to, yeah, also kind of pull back your expectations of where you're going to get to, when you're going to get to them and that, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I feel like, I hope that answered it. Thanks. And you also very uh, cleverly answered the next question, which was from Kate about collectivising the vote. So you've managed to deal with both at once, which is fabulous. So I think um, there are a couple of things I want to say just in wrapping up. There is so much in all of that wisdom, Larissa. Thank you so much for sharing it. We had a couple of objectives around today. One was obviously to share this very specific case study, uh, partly because it has so many very astute and relevant observations about organising in general, no matter what community, but also some specific insights into organising in communities that might be hard, that, that are harder to reach. But also because we wanted to pay tribute to the amazing campaigning and organising work that is being done by, in First Nations around issues that matter to those communities. Uh, and as part of reminding ourselves about that, I want, I'm going to invite Rhys to share some new things that we're doing around uh, building strength and moving resources to support First Nations communities in their campaigning and organising. And also, um, I always like to make sure that when we're thinking about these things to also have people uh, be reminded of any opportunities for solidarity actions. So, Rhys. Yeah, so... Um... First of all, we are launching a, a community organizing fellowship and a, it's a campaigning space that's just for First Nations. So we've done over the last 18 months an all a messaging fellowship with and campaigning fellowship with um, 20 Aboriginal people across the country. Um, and we're basically, we've had a bunch of people reach out to us that want to get involved in campaign uh, and learn about some stuff and, you know, can you help us do this thing on our strategy? So we're going to bring those people together uh, who are already kind of reaching out and just, you know, focus on having a training space that's just with mob because it is so important to when we think about how, you know, I talked about this strategy being very iterative and within the way that we do things. Um, we want to create a space where people don't have to adapt, you know, organising training or a campaigning training to a community. We want to be able to create a space where people can do that work together and kind of work out what works for them and have, uh, yeah, so very excited that kind of in the last week we were just like, let's just do this thing. There's lots of people asking us to do it. So very excited that next year we will offer that. Um, and there are already people applying for it and ringing about it and being very excited about it. So if you know people, you can also donate to uh, support places on it and stuff like that. But it's shared around because there's lots of young mob that are, you know, out there thinking about getting engaged in this work. And really it's really hard to have an entry in. So one of the things that we want to use this fellowship for is to, um, bring people in who are understanding and you know kind of being there are a lot of young black fellows out there now on the streets and not like in terms of like protesting and stuff like that and getting engaged in campaigns but not sure how to get an entry into a place where you can work in this space so we really want to pitch this at a level of like you know come into the space get an experience this is how we can teach you how to do these things and then hopefully through this you know we're bringing more people into this movement who know and understand how to move around their community so it's, it's more of an entry level thing, but we're really, really excited to do it. And um, we've got a bunch of uh, deadly black fellas that are gonna help do it. Um, and just like everyone just donating their time and but it's, you're yeah, really excited to do it and people are really excited to take part of it. So it's been something we've been talking about for a long time and we're really excited to do. Um, in terms of the campaign around fracking, um, I would say that we're in, we're obviously running a campaign to stop public money going into fracking, but Really where we're at is there are a lot of companies in the NT uh, now drilling and kind of exploring. And we know that Narrabri has gone ahead. Uh, I would say there is um, 
I think the, the Facebook page is Gamilla Ray Next Generation. So there is a big campaign with TOs where they're working on, uh, sorry, I wish I had the link, but there's a new community run campaign that they're, they're running. And so supporting the, the traditional owners in Narrabri, knowing there's some big pressure coming down in, around gas. We know wet season is coming up in the NT. We're gonna start sharing. We've got kind of community set up to do a lot of citizen journalism around what's happening in wet season and talking about stories. So over the next couple of months, those communities will kind of go down into a lockdown area, but still be mindful on socials. If you see the stories, share the stories because we're trying to say fracking is way too risky in the NT um and try and push these companies out so we know we're going to go into that period we're focusing on telling those stories digitally and that sort of thing the other thing is one more thing um so next week at the end of next week the recommendations are coming down for the federal heritage act um from the inquiry the disaster that happened at the Dukun caves and rio tinto blowing up that site so get ready to put some, some pressure on the federal government because if those recommendations are not good, we need to push the federal government to make them better. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. So lots of things for people to do. The links are in the chat. Uh, we launched the website for the First Nations Fellowship this morning. So you can share that with people. There is on that page a place where you can donate to help um, as a solidarity action to help pay for someone to participate. And Holly's just put in the chat the, um, the Gamilla Rai Next Generation name so that if you want to follow that on Facebook, you can. So just in wrapping up, I'd love it if you wanted to also just chuck in the chat something you're taking away from today's session. It's always good to know how it's going to help impact on your work in your organising. Um, and I think there were so many things. So... I will also just do a plug for the fact that we have our last of these webinars uh, coming up in the first week of December. It will be with Pete Murray, who's the founder of Accelerate Change, which helps uh, organizations scale up their organizing by looking at uh, function, what he calls functional organizing. He'll talk through all that. But if you are interested in a preview of that, he wrote an article for the Stanford Social Innovation Review a few years ago called Secret of, Secrets of Scale. And we'll also, we'd be really keen to hear from you and I'll probably send a survey around um, separately, but whether these webinars are useful and whether you want us to keep doing them next year. So I think, um, okay, Danny's going, yes, okay, no survey needed. Oh, okay, lots of thumbs up, excellent. Save me writing a survey. Uh, I'm hoping that they're achieving what we've been, we wanted, which was to create some space for people to look up and out get a bit of a shot of inspiration, get out of the weeds a bit and hear some of the best things that are happening around Australia and the world. And the more we think about it, there's no shortage of great examples. It's just a matter of bringing them to your screen. And it's actually in some ways easier to do this online than if we were trying to do in-person seminars and certainly much more accessible. We have someone joining us today from the Grampians on a satellite internet connection, um, as well as people from all over um, wherever they are in Australia. So it's been fabulous seeing you all and thank you for joining us. I want to invite everyone to unmute so we can say thank you and goodbye to Larissa. But round of applause for keep up the amazing work. We're looking forward to the First Nations Fellowship and um, we'll see you all again, if not uh, in the one in December at another time. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Larissa. Bye. Thank you, Larissa. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Yay.